and uh, there was no foolishness in the class. I did not feel any personal involvement with them. I couldn't relate to them because they didn't really relate to me. It was like a factory. I was there, they taught me, and uh, if I needed this additional instruction, they gave it to me. But I felt no personal warmth in that relationship. And then my mother, and I guess everything has happened to me I owe to her decision, decided that Connecticut was not a place for her children. And she determined to bring them south to Washington for an education. And to me, that was the most important decision she ever made in respect to my future. And I appreciate it today for all that is done for me. My father, however, who had been born in Massachusetts and who had grown up with the boys, hated Washington in the South with a fury that was unimaginable. And when she decided she was coming South, and if he wanted to come, he could, <laughs> she was going. <laughs> well, he was a machinist working in a gun factory. So he had a good job. He was a skilled worker, and they paid him accordingly. He didn't want to leave because he wasn't going down to hell, mm -hmm. as he called. Well, finally, after we'd been here about three months, he did move to Washington, kicking and screaming all the way. <laughs> and he moved to Washington with an abiding hate of the South mm -hmm. and all that it meant to him. My mother brought us to Washington, and the first school I enrolled in was Stevens School. And that first day at noon, when some upperclassmen, incidentally, I moved into the fifth grade, apparently the teachers thought that since New England schools are supposed to be better, uh, they would, and I had finished the fourth grade, they were going to put me in the second semester of the fifth grade. Well, I struggled. <laughs> I was in mathematics over my capacity. I knew that soon. But at any rate, that first 12 o'clock noon recess, some upperclassman was trying to goad me into a fight. Mm. And I heard a quiet voice say to the fellow, say, leave him alone. The voice belonged to Charlie Drew. Mm. I'll never forget Charlie. He saved me from a being. <laughs> now, I'll always be great. <laughs> he was in the eighth grade, I was in the fifth grade. But now, the difference. Those teachers, Miss Moore, Miss Burgess, Miss Millie Gibbs, involved themselves with the students personally. And I got what I needed. Motivation. Correction discipline and more than that I, I felt a sort of love that they showed even though they were stern I felt that somehow they were interested in me as they were in all the students and so that was the big difference between what I found in a segregated system here in Washington and what I found in New England I was in a factory in New England and Washington, segregated schools, Stevens particularly, I was in a loving environment, a concerned group of teachers, and I responded to it. We were Miss Moore's students, Miss Gibbs' students, and we had to carry that image of the school, behave in the streets, do our work, realize we had to be better. Constant motivation, constant involvement with us. And we responded to it. Because somehow they gave us a sense of success, a sense of purpose, and a sense of self-worth. I didn't have a sense of self-worth in Connecticut. Now I know later my mother brought me to Washington 
the public schools because she saw a future for me in Connecticut as being somebody's butler. Now, don't misunderstand me. It was no future. A butler, a yardman, a chauffeur, that's about all. Unless I happened to be a skilled mechanic or machinist like my father, and that wasn't possible with my limitations, mechanically speaking. But at any rate, I was here in Washington. Then we finished greatest school, and incidentally in that school was the late Sarah Moore, who was being the principal here. We went to Dunbar, and uh, there we found another group of dedicated teachers. Now, LeVoyne has already told you about many of them, that background. I'm not going into that particular aspect of that training and preparation. But the school, its curriculum, you could take four years of Latin. You could take as much French as you wanted, German, Italian. You could take two years of physics. You could take as much mathematics as you wanted. The opportunities were there. The teachers were there, qualified to teach you. The curriculum was the best. It was varied. It was strong. It was preparatory for college. In fact, as Laverne has indicated, those students going out of Dunbar didn't go to a prep school. They walked straight into Amherst, Dartmouth, Yale, Harvard, Michigan, all classmates there. Mm -hmm. Without any doubt, without any hesitation about acceptance. If the schools were segregated, they prepared you to enter that world of an integrated college situation. These are the things I remember. These are the things I appreciate. Then, as we move on, we think about the students. In our class, there was Joe Jenkins, Nick mm -hmm. Langhorn, Julia Delaney, <laughs> Lillian Washington, Ralph Wright, Klein Price, Francis, well, I mentioned Francis, and many others. In the upper classes, we had Bill Hasty, Monty Carr, and incidentally, I was in his B company when he was captain, Honey Chase, John Davis. They were great. Incidentally, we students knew they were great. We even had a song. I'm not going to try to sing it. I'll say the words, Hasty Facey and Chasey Too, the Little Day Boy and Charlie Drew. We sure. sang that song. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? Yeah. They were great, and we knew they were great. Mm. Then in the lower classes, we had Bob Weaver, and we had uh, uh, yeah, some others I can't call right now because there's so many of them. These were the students who were achieving, who were doing something with their lives who had a sense of direction. Now we talk about segregated school, but walk into Dunbar and walk in there in the 20s and you could see the Colosseum. You could see the Acropolis. We could see all of this statuary, pictures, paintings. We had art all around us. It was a part of the environment. Then, as Laverne has indicated, we have our <coughs> plays, we had our drills, we had something else in terms of student participation, student productions, and, if you will, the development of student talent. These were a part of that complete environment that we found in Dunbar. And I'm sure we found that same kind of devotion in Dunbar, I mean, in uh, Armstrong and in Cardozo. This was a part of that disciplined, dedicated teaching staff. If we talk about teachers, and since I am an English major, I've mentioned uh, Mrs. Elsie Brown Smith. I mentioned, uh, or I will mention indeed, Miss Mustafa, Miss McNeil, and in the area of physics, Professor Weatherless, 
who would not permit you to use a colloquial term in describing a scientific experiment. And I recall one student once when he was finding the point of condensation on a calorie and just said, well, the cup switched. <laughs> and he just professed well as this, he jumped out of his chair and challenged that boy, you say it in the right word. You talk about the dew point or condensation. No sloppy language in here. <laughs> These were the teachers who held you to standards. And if you will, I think about again the person who has been mentioned so often. And I'm going to tell you a personal story here. In 1922, I was serving the Washington Herald early in the morning. And after I served the paper, I would take the paper home and read the letters in the morning. In addition to the news, I always read the editorial page. On this editorial page, on this occasion, some man named Schufelt, connected with the Smithsonian Institute, had indicated that he had experienced or he'd seen an experience or seen a, a scene on a streetcar on a particular morning in which a Negro was sitting down beside another passenger. There were a number of women standing and this white man ordered this Negro to get up and give his seat to a white woman. And the colored man immediately and neatly got up and gave him the seat, gave her the seat. I read the news, the, the letter, and I became angry. So I sat down and wrote a letter to the editor criticizing both what the man said and also the inference in the letter. When I got to school the day the letter was published in the newspaper, Mr. Douglas was waiting for me. Mm. And he said, mm. Tim, are you a junior? I said, no, sir. Then you wrote that letter to the editor? I said, yeah. Well, I was a race man then. <laughs> was Judge, uh, Fred, I mean, uh, Haley Douglas was so impressed by the fact that a high school boy would write a letter like that to the editor expressing regrets for something which he felt was uncalled for and therefore unnecessary, merely stirring up fervor and animosity between races. He told Mr. Thomas about it. He also told Mr. E.B. Hemmer, Dr. E.B. Hemmer, and so for a day there, I was a hero, in a sense. And I recall a couple of days later, as I walked into Mr. Thomas's class, still basking in that so-called popularity, Mr. Thomas called upon me, and I wasn't prepared. <laughs> and Mr. Thomas sarcastically and by the way, he had a sense of humor, mm -hmm. reminded me that if I spend as much time studying history as I did writing letters to the editor, mm -hmm. I'll be a much better student of history. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Thomas was like that. Was like that. He was a dynamic personality. Everything that he taught was vivid. Everything that he taught was related to pr current problems, current issues, political and otherwise. This was Mr. Thomas. He had an abiding hatred of mercy. <laughs> and all you had to do in his class was to get up and recite and quote mercy. <laughs> Any authority, Encyclopedia Britannica, Lord's Beacon Lights, which is to get anybody but mercy. <laughs> the other thing was, that Mr. Thomas insisted that whatever you said in class, you should document. Mm. If you had no documentation, keep your mouth shut. Because the first thing he would ask you was, did you read the footnote? And you said, no, I didn't read the footnote, Mr. Thomas. Said, okay, I'll flunk you, and you, I'll, you go back and read the small print next time. <laughs> He was that kind of stimulating teacher. Everything that he taught, he had pictures, photographs of himself by the Sphinx. Near the pyramids. He made history alive. In addition, as Litt has indicated, he was the first president of the NACP branch here. He appeared before Congress. And one time the congressman challenged him 
I'm coming to something else in a minute. Mm -hmm. About his appearance in respect to a budget hearing on education. Mr. Thomas told the gentleman that he was not only a teacher, but he was a citizen. He was wearing his citizen's hat as he testified. The thing that we need, thank you, they're going to close me off in just a moment, and anything else that we got from Dunbar, we also got, in addition, the support from the churches, the ministry, the teachers, who helped us in situations outside of the classroom. In 1945, we and a certain community out in Northeast were advised that a new school was going to be named there in Anacostia Avenue and uh, Hay Street. And the proposed name was for that of a school to be named for a superintendent of schools. A number of us thought that we had a better choice. We wrote a letter to the Board of Education indicating we wanted the school to be named for Mr. Neville H. Thomas. Mm -hmm. I recall that Molly Brewer and some other people called. We got together and we found that uh, there seemed to be some reluctance on the part of the board to name the school. So we called Charlie Drew, Monty Cobb, and Bill Hastings. They wrote letters to the board. Other people wrote letters to the board. And today the school is named the Neville H. Thomas School mm -hmm. for a dynamic history teacher who not only taught history, but he took the role of leadership in addition to his duties as teacher. If I may say anything else here, I would say to you who are listening and who have shared some of these experiences in your own way, in your own personal evaluation, that the spirit of Dunbar has lived it will live, and that those qualities of excellence, those qualities of competition and adequacy in training are part of our heritage. Segregation, it was, in my estimation, an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I think we'll have questions from the audience, but before we do, I would like to make one position clear. Uh, when we integrated the schools back in 54 here in Washington, we had a sessions lasting hours, on, upon hours, for two years preceding that on a subject called intercultural relationships so that the community would not uh, criticize us or, or, or say that we should be removed because we're advocating integration. You know, we have to deal with Congress. Mm -hmm. But I think in all the emulations of what's happened at Dunbar and what good results came from segregation of our schools, it's not to mean that uh, we feel or we presently feel that that would be the best system because as long as you wear a badge of inferiority on your chest, as long as you can go where you want to go, do what you want to do, as long as you can't strike back when you're struck, then you have no freedom. Segregation can't compensate for that. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, the first one is, in terms of the hierarchy or color, how does that interest they say the school is going to black skin, the dark skin, white skin, and then the school is there. I know in the West Indies, other countries, it's a I refer that to one of the Dunbar people here because they have been criticized for that. I'll be very glad to answer that. Uh, if you take a yearbook from any year of the Dunbar School, you will find in that book people of all colors, from light to dark. And the, uh, the so far as the teachers were concerned, they encouraged the, and I was a teacher there as well as the students, <coughs> we encouraged the students to uh, achieve and we didn't uh, think of the color of their skin when they were doing it we just wanted excellence and when we found excellence we gave credit for excellence now I think there are some students who attended the three high schools there were three Armstrong, Cardoza and Dunbar who may have felt that they were being excluded 
socially from some of the activities but I think a lot of it was in the minds of the students because we did try to have clubs for all activities and most of the clubs included people not on the basis of their skin color but on the basis of their likenesses and the things that they like to do. So I wouldn't say that there was any great uh, stigma attached to people of darker color. I think that we took it in our stride and did the very best that we could with it. Thank you. Uh, don't be misled. I'm from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming up as a youth, you had these groups. <coughs> you know, the girls went to girls' high school. If you were brown skin, you couldn't go to girls' high school. And that's an integrated city. No, 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 ma'am. You had to be light and bright and almost white. <laughs> <laughs> who, who made the decision? Uh, yeah. Beg pardon? Who made the decision? No one made the decision, but it was an accepted practice. That, that's, what, that, that's what I think mm -hmm. criticism is made of Dunbar. Mm -hmm. It was an accepted, accepted practice, but it was not uh, something or, that you had to do or that was axiomatic. Mm. Uh, another question. Harlan, you should have a question over there. Oh, I can't see. Who is it? Yes. There. Cadoza was the business school, Armstrong was the technical or vocational school, and Dunbar was the academic school. That was way back then. And they all think that was later. That was later. Mm -hmm. I think your spin gun was built now, opened up in 1955. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Big pardon? 52. Mm -hmm. When did they get the books? In 55? <laughs> 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 Another question? <laughs> yes, up here. Oh, oh. But it really disturbed me when I came back to Washington uh, about two years ago. And, you know, I now live in Shaw with my grandparents, uh, residing in Shaw. But the disturbing thing to me was that I've noticed that a lot of black landmarks in the city have been Oh. And I came back and was old Dunbar, and I thought it was a My question is, how come something The person who asked the question, there is a long, lengthy fight in this city to preserve the old landmark Dunbar High School. Uh, I uh, might say that uh, this uh, campaign went on for about two years before uh, it was finally demolished. Uh, the mayor of the city, the uh, congressman uh, representative, uh, did not uh, push the fight <coughs> to preserve this old landmark. But I do think that uh, that school could have been preserved as a historical landmark. There's so much history connected with it. In fact, the woman who was supposed to be the moderator of this panel, uh, Marjorie Parker, she made a speech in defense of preserving that school. And I never forget what she said to uh, the council people, and uh, members of the council. She said, if you are so much interested in keeping this school so it can uh, alleviate the people of low income, why don't you move your, your office down here in the Dunbar High School? That will show that you're interested in keeping this school. She called, told the members of the city council, of course, none of them agreed to come down there. To, they had their office in Dunbar High School. They couldn't think of moving, moving the district building. But uh, we, we, another thing we need to, to remember, that uh, Dunbar had a strong academic tradition and many people went through it. We could preserve it as a museum. 
but also there was an academic program at Armstrong High School. They had some very fine teachers over there, and a lot of those students went on to college and became prominent. But Dunbar was uh, concentrated uh, primarily from the beginning for the training of academic minds. I think they or should have had some trades. They took printing out of Dunbar, put it over at Armstrong. I think everybody with academic training should have some vocational subjects in his training. Uh, for yeah. the gentleman, yeah. to further answer to your question, there, there was a great movement on here to preserve that school, but some of the things that interfered with it was, for example, they had a swimming pool over there. And I remember back in the 40s, we could have had that swimming pool fixed for $15,000. And when it was finally, you remember that, it was finally fixed, I think it cost around seventy-five or 80000 That's because Congress controlled our purse strings just like they're controlling it now. And uh, as they've told us, we're going to have the electric chair and all that. You know that. But one other thing I want to add here, uh, the other school in the city that's played a big part in the city of the city of Sedona, um, I went to a town meeting about uh, four months ago, and I was stopped for those of Brian Patterson, uh, both of them from there and from there. I don't think God. He was a dose of that uh, on the... that uh, most of the uh, officers in World War II in the Army uh, were products of the cadet system of Washington High School. And everybody knows the first general was uh, a Dunbar graduate, General Benjamin Davis. And we uh, supplied many generals, and uh, uh, many generals now were, uh, were products of the D.C. cadet system. I think of uh, um, General Robinson, uh, General Chambers, Admiral Chambers, yeah. these are three contemporaries now who were trained in the cadet system. Uh, I remember uh, that was really uh, something that uh, it was preparatory. If you went into the Army and Navy, you thought you had this background, as I did. I never forget looking up at 25,000 people down there on me. If I made a mistake, everybody in the 25,000 in the crowd knew about it. But uh, the discipline of the cadet corps was something that we I never forgot. But I remember some of the military training when I went into the Navy. Uh, it uh, was something, too, that gave you a sense of pride. I mean, that time, drilling for your country, many Negroes don't feel that now. But at least you thought that uh, you would be prepared to bear arms in case uh, there was a war. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Division 10 and 13 were, were for the black schools, 1 to one to 10 were white schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They were all regional. They were all but And all regional, too. Yeah. But those numbers were confined to mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. schools. Yes, ma'am. Well, as you remember, back there we had six whites and three blacks. And yeah, it's it's back there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Fifty-one. Say back. Fifty-one. There were, were six whites and three blacks. <laughs> the great problem immediately then was the reappointment of the superintendent, who was then Corning. Everybody hated Corning, and uh, I think he was blamed for a lot of things that he wasn't responsible for, because he, he advocated to Congress. But well, nonetheless, that was the immediate problem. Then the next problem came when they wanted to move Cadoza uh, High School, I mean, 
Yeah, because Cato's the road mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. They want the, they, they want the, it was overcrowded. Cato's was overcrowded, and they had to have another building. Central High School up on the where they're now located had about a handful of students. That was a white school. So rather than what you want to ask, but unfortunately we are set to lend us the time and I again thank you and that's the thing drawback.